right, friends, this episode is with Brad Jensen. He is known as the sober bodybuilder on Instagram. Um, Brad is a friend. He lives here in Utah locally. He owns a company called Key Nutrition. It's a really um, well-esteemed nutrition company here in Utah. He has a team of coaches. Um, and he also is like really popular for his content on Instagram. He does such a great job keeping it real, talking about what matters, what doesn't. Um, he even has a lot of really funny content that I think you'll enjoy. So make sure you follow him on Instagram at, at, at the sober bodybuilder. Also his podcast is really popular. Um, it's called the key nutrition podcast. He is the host and he's just, he's so good at interviewing and he's funny. So it's just really enjoyable to listen to while you also get great content and great information. So make sure you, um, find the link in the show notes for that. Um, but in this episode, Brad tells his story, why he's called the sober bodybuilder, man, I really appreciated him just being so open and vulnerable and just sharing his path. Um, there are so many people who have fallen into addiction, but so there's so much shame and stigma around it. It's so unnecessary. And I'm just really grateful to Brad for opening up and sharing like, Hey, this is what happened to me. And this is all the crap. And this is how hard it was. And this is how I got out of it. Um, and now he's like a very successful entrepreneur with a thriving coaching company. It's just, it's amazing. Um, so I just appreciate Brad so much for keeping it real in this episode. Um, and we get into the end about like, you know, stuff that he thought was woo woo once upon a time has actually been a big part of his path to healing and being sober. So you guys know I'm all about that. So it's, um, it's just such a great episode. I think you guys are really going to remember this one. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump into it. Here is Brad Jensen. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away. And I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios, right? So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about higher coaching. This is my coaching system and I get a lot of questions because, um, it's not just training and nutrition. We do that. I love training and nutrition, obviously, but we also do more. We do personal development and the way that's delivered is a 90 day personal development program that you go through with me when you work with me. So it's a video course with questions for you to deep dive in yourself for the first 90 days of working with me. Now that comes as part of a morning routine. I am really big on the morning routine and you ask any of my clients, I will push you on that because it's life changing. So we start with meditation and then we do gratitude and then that personal development program. Um, that's our deep dive psychologically. And after the 90 days, you go to the next level, you start doing what I'm doing currently. And it's a lot of strategic goal setting and it's really, really honestly, miraculous what's happening, not only in my life, but in my clients lives. Like it brings me to tears when I get on calls with them. I'm like, do you see yourself? Like, do you see what you're doing? That is so cool. So anyway, that is um, for me, the bread and butter of my coaching. I love it so much. Um, also though, 
In, in regards to your body, I also like to go deep dive and see what might be holding you back. So that's where all the biohacking side comes in. We do a physiological deep dive as well. So we do blood testing, hair mineral testing, DNA testing, body composition, or a ring. Um, so your heart rate variability, your sleep cycles. Do you have any deficiencies? Do you have issues with sleep you didn't even know about? Let's find out, you know? Um, so that's, that's how I approach things in higher. There's more, we do prizes every month, Nikes, Lulu's, um, all my favorite products and foods to keep you motivated, to keep those habits up. We do three zoom calls a week. So you get support. We have a private Facebook group. We're all vibing and, and cheering each other along the way. We get raw and real and honest. And it's just, yeah, it's like, I created my life and I created my life the way I like and I like to deep dive with a bunch of bad A people that really want to optimize their lives and it's an honor for me to serve them in that. Um, so I just thought I would tell you about it because I don't know if I talk about it quite enough. So if you're looking for that, if you're like wanting the next level in your body and also in your life, truly, that's what we're doing. So. Uh, seeking bad A's <laughs> to join higher. I do have some spots open. Um, it is limited. I can only handle so many clients at a time, but if you would like to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can go to my website, taragarrison.com and you can request a call and we can see if, if it's a great fit for you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you guys about higher so you could get a little glimpse into what I'm doing on the daily. And if you're looking for something a little more self-guided, I do have my keto in and out program, um, on my website. Site. So you can either do a small taste and try it for eight weeks, or you can go a full year. That baby is comprehensive. There is a video of every recipe, video of every exercise. There's a 60 day course teaching you how to do keto or 30 days of keto. And then 30 days of bringing back the carbs, FAQ video library, Facebook group, like all of that. So if you're more of like the self guided person and you just want stuff planned for you, um, that is also an option on my website. It's taragarrison.com. I'll link it all in the show notes and all right, we'll go ahead and get into our episode. All right, guys. So I've got Brad here. Brad is kind of a, he's kind of a thing in Utah and the local Utah fitness scene. We love our, we love our Brad Jensen. <laughs> Brad is Brad's account is what I call um, catharsis for coaches because generally the frustrations that we all feel as, as coaches, Brad does a really good job of portraying those online. Um, sometimes via alternate personalities like Sheena, sometimes just through just really cool, clever content. So I really appreciate that from you. Cause I always either laugh or I'm like, exactly. <laughs> but before we get into like how you got there and your whole, you know, mindset around fat loss and muscle gain and what it really takes, um, I want to jump into your story because on Instagram, you're known as the sober bodybuilder and your story's freaking awesome. So can you start us off with that, with your, your own personal journey with fitness? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always respected, you know, when, um, when I asked you to come on my show, I mean, gosh, that was, I mean, I was still married. That was a long time. I mean, a year and a half ago, maybe. Yeah. The key nutrition podcast, by the way, guys, which is so yeah, it good. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. It was a while ago. Thank you. That was a long time ago, but I met, I was, you know, I've always liked your content and I, I just know what it takes to constantly be coming up with content every day. So I respect you and appreciate that. It's not Thank as easy you. as people think, especially when you're like, okay, how many messages do I really want to spit? Right. And so, right. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, like you said, my name is the sober bodybuilder. I don't actively compete in bodybuilding anymore. Although watching uh, your journey, I'm like, maybe I should do it one more time. You know, <laughs> that's how Lindsay Matthews, trainer Lindsay, our mutual friend, she's like kind of like <laughs> living vicariously through me. I think everyone who's done it before is kind of like, oh, like you're you're rose colored glassing it. I promise, it sucks. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. <laughs> um. But uh, yeah, it's been fun to watch you go through that because honestly, I think what's really cool, sorry to talk about you for a sec, but is you're an example of somebody who should have competed. And what I mean by that is like, you stay in shape year round. This is your lifestyle. This mm -hmm. is what you do. And then it was like, why not try this fun goal I've never done? Mm -hmm. It's the people that constantly use competing as the only time they are going to try. Like I see these goals. Right. I'm like, why don't you just try having a couple of years where it's just because it's what you do. You just love health and fitness. Yep. But that's it's like a, this goal of competing and then they go back and back and right. 
Yeah. And they're really setting themselves up for disaster. Cause like, you kind of know that they're using that goal as a way to like, kind of be enough or look enough or drive their behaviors instead of like, gosh, for me, I'm like, oh man, does it really have to be this intense and strict? Like I, <laughs> I I'm literally, literally only doing it as a, as an experiment, honestly, to learn the industry. And I've learned a lot. Like there is more positive to it than I was giving it credit for. Um, it is a sport. It is, you know, something that, um, I don't know, it has its own set of rules, just like football, just like basketball, just like all of those things. But, um, you know, I think people going into it, like I'd say, don't do it unless you already have a pretty good, healthy self-esteem. Otherwise I feel like you're going to get like knocked to your knees, <laughs> um, as you're going through it anyway, for me anyway, but tell me your story. Let's not, this is, this is your show, Brad, <laughs> just your show. Divert. Yeah. yeah I mean, no, you let me just interview you. How about that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so my name is the sober bodybuilder. I don't actively compete anymore. So I always make a joke that I better keep staying sober. I'll be the not sober, not body. I'll be the not sober, <laughs> retired bodybuilder, which is not catchy. So, um, all right, you got to do it again then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my sobriety date is, uh, November 20th of 2012. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. And, um, you know, my story was I grew up as a you know, an overweight kid and looking back, if I could just go back and just hug that little 12 year old kid and just tell him it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, you just haven't hit that growth. It's just that awkward 12 year old age, you know? Yep. And, and I was definitely big. I found some pictures recently. Um, I, I mean, I was definitely chubby, but uh -huh. I thought I was like morbidly <laughs> obese, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I hung around with kids who I thought were shredded. They were just skinny. Right. So you could like see visible abdominals and like obliques because they were rail thin. Right. And so I was teased a little bit, you know, by my friends and, and that, um, you know, kind of sucked. And of course mm. it did. And, you know, I learned to use humor. So I started emulating things like Chris Farley, uh, the mm. van down by the river skit off Saturday Night Live, like the motivational speaker, Matt Foley and, mm -hmm. and Tommy Boy. I knew every line to, and I figured, mm. okay, I get these people laughing with me. But along that way, I started drinking alcohol because that's what they were doing. And I, and I liked it. Um, I liked the feeling. I hated the taste, but, but it intrigued me. Like I liked it. Um, and about 14, 15 years old, I got into to fitness and it was just kind of happened to be, I was at a bookstore, found these, uh, my mom was up. That's why people went to bookstores back then. It was like 1997. <laughs> and, uh, she was up shop for a book. I was in the magazine section. I remember just seeing like a muscle and fitness. And I remember thinking, I want to look like that guy. And it made no sense to me because I never lifted weights. I'm a 14 year old kid, 14, maybe 15. So I, I started picking up, started reading. I was just enthralled with it. Like I was, it was mm -hmm. the first time in my life I'd felt passionate about anything. And so I kept going back to that same bookstore. And after, after school, I'd ride my bike and I just read, I read the encyclopedia of bodybuilding. I read everything I could get my hands on. And um, I started applying what they were teaching me in these magazines. It was probably for like a bikini girl, but um, I was eating like canned tuna fish in the hallways as a sophomore in high school, but wow. I got really into it and my body transformed. And during that time too, I hit a growth spurt. So I ended up being too skinny. And so um, I got into lifting and that's when everything just changed. I got my license. So I, I signed up for a gym pass and, and it was game over. I just loved it. But during that time I had read how bad alcohol was for building muscle. And the way I interpreted the information was like, if you drink, you're going to like lose every ounce of muscle you've worked for. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't educated enough to, to know that like, okay, there's probably moderation, but I just quit cold, alcohol, cold Turkey. I told my buddies, I can't party anymore. Nope, nothing. And uh, along that way in high school, but like, I still wanted to get messed up. Like it still intrigued me to do that. Um, right. Can I swear on this podcast or do you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. They should know by now. I still really <laughs> wanted to get fucked up. Um, and you know, because inside I was, I was still broken. Like I was still, even though I had more for my body, I got the hottest girl in school. Like I was popular. Like I was a jacked little 17 year old kid. I was obsessed with lifting and eating and um, eating all the right stuff but I was still broken inside. And, and that, that ran a theme through a lot of years in my life. And that's why today, like health and fitness is the icing on the cake to like, I have to be right mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And like, then this is a fun thing, but um, you know, and I was introduced to pain pills. Um, and I'll never forget this kid, this kid offered them to me. He said, uh, 
he said, you want to get messed up at this party? I'm like, oh, I can't. I've got uh, leg day tomorrow or something. You know, I can't do it. And uh, he said, you want these lower tabs? And this is how naive I still was. He said, I said, oh, I'm not in any pain. I don't, I don't need any pain pills. And he goes, no, no, no. They'll make you feel like you're drunk, but you don't have to, uh, you don't have a hangover. So I was like, well, let me take them. I remember t- the minute I took those, like, that's what I wanted the rest of my life. Like the feeling hit me. You know, so many people I hear, they take pain pills and they're like, I hated them. I'm like, man, I loved it. I felt whole for the first time. Like, Mm. my anxieties went away my insecurities and Mm. I wanted to do that I was like that's the feeling I want the rest of my life and so I chased it and and to the point where you know I'll kind of I'll kind of go through this quick but by the end of my senior year I had found a way to go down to Tijuana Mexico to go to the pharmacies to load up my door panels take them off put them back on full of every kind of you know um pain pill somas um you know, steroids, you name it, and was getting away with this. I would drive through the border and no consequences. And so I started selling to all the high schools and, and I started doing these every single day, these opiates and no real consequences. Like, I, I mean, I was definitely probably moderately abusing them, but like not excessively, like I still went to school and did all this. Mm. And, uh, the end of my senior year, right at the very end, a kid, went down to Mexico, he got caught. They kept him in a Mexican prison. I remember thinking, I'm way too pretty to go to prison. I'm not going back, I'm not doing that again. So I was like, okay, these will run out and then I'll just stop doing these. But I've been doing them every day for like six or seven months straight. Never, and, and the kids I was selling them to, it wasn't like I was selling to junkies. I was selling them to kids at different high schools who did them on the weekends. So I didn't see the ugly side of like withdrawals or addiction. And, um, man, those pain pills ran out and it was, I was the gnarly sickest I'd ever been. And I was like, this is awful, awful. And it was so much worse than I thought it was going to be. And it was at that time it was presented to me. Um, some, I was wrong place, wrong time, wrong person said, Hey, I've got some heroin. And I remember distinctly thinking, you know, I grew up in, in, uh, the LDS religion. I mean, I wasn't active, but like I was good morals and values. My parents didn't drink alcohol even, and I remember thinking that was a line in the sand I'd drawn. I don't like heroin is ew. And it took me all about 20 minutes. And I was like, let me see it. So I shot up heroin. Uh, first time ever, I shot it up. That's how we had it ready. And uh, I remember that guy looked at me and he said, kid, your life's never gonna be the same. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, me- I remember thinking like, I don't know what that, like, I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, no, I'm not gonna keep doing this, man. Heroin's gross. Like, I'm not- wow. And the next day I was sick again. And so- found the heroin and heroin was much cheaper than pain pills. Wow. And so it started down a gnarly route from there until, uh, so that was, uh, 2003. And, and basically from 2003 to 2012 was just full of, of a decade long addiction. I wow. mean, it was incomprehensible demoralization. It was, you know, it's just, there is not a, I have not yet met one person that's like an active heroin addict. That's also like a CEO of a wildly successful business has a thriving marriage and family. And it just doesn't happen. Like you yeah. just don't meet successful heroin addicts. And even if you look at rock stars, like the, you know, eventually, you know, they die from it. Like, mm-hmm. and so it was just ugly, you know, and, and, and it, uh, it got worse, never better. I would have brief moments of sobriety. I went to my first treatment center when, in 2005. I'll never forget when I told my mom I was doing heroin. I mean, I didn't look like a heroin addict. Like for a long time in my addiction, I still worked out. It was the most bizarre. My sister remembers me trying to make a rice cake and peanut butter one night. And I nodded out and the peanut butter and the rice cake got stuck to my forehead. But I was so... <laughs> I had to have my protein shake and my peanut butter. Like, it was so weird. Looking back, I'm like, good for you. How did you keep that up? <laughs> like, so when I told my mom, I said, uh, you know, I said, I need some help. She said, what's going on? She knew I was partying, but I didn't live at home. And I said, I'm addicted to heroin. And the phone dropped. It was a solid 30 seconds. I was mm-hmm. like, hello? She dropped the phone and she was like, what? So let's get you into treatment. So I went to my first treatment center and I went in there thinking heroin was my problem. I really did. And so I got out of that treatment center and I said, okay, well, heroin's my problem, but you know, I'm going to party and and drink and do some other stuff. And 
you know, eventually it just led me right back to the heroin. And mm -hmm. so a bunch of treatment centers later and, um, you know, what, I think six or seven. And during that time too, I started getting arrested. And if you get arrested and get caught in the system and you're not ready to get clean because they put you on probation, you'll just keep going back. So I had 17 bookings into the county jail, went to six or seven different treatment centers. And every time I heard the same thing and finally it clicked. I remember the last treatment center I went to, and it's not even when I got sober, it finally clicked in me that heroin, meth, whatever drug was not my problem. Brad was my problem. Like I was my problem. Those were my solution. Mm. Like the drugs were my solution to the problem, but the problem was me. Like, cause I tried just getting away from the drugs and if it was just the drugs, why did I keep going back? Why would I get 60 or 90 days clean, start getting a life back and then destroy it all. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, I, I'm sorry. I'm like really going long tangents. I hate when guests. No, are. please, please, please don't okay. <laughs> apologize. <laughs> so feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, and, and I remember that in 2009, it finally hit me and I was like, okay. I'm my pro like, I've got to do some work and they're giving me these tools. But I just wasn't ready. And I look at some of the clients I've had over the last decade and mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just, sometimes you're just not ready. We can give them all the solution. We can, Oh, you got to do that. Like, you know, and yeah. if they're not ready, they're just not going to do it. And so yeah. I just wasn't ready. And I, and I don't know, you know, people always ask me what finally clicked and I'm not really sure because towards the end of my using, um, it got really bad. And what happened is my parents at that treatment center in 2009 got involved with a program called Al-Anon. Now, Al-Anon is the sister program to A. And basically, they learned that they were going to love me to death. Like, they were enabling me to death. Like, they kept bailing me out, bailing me out of jail, bailing me out of situations. I would run up a drug debt that was some gnarly people I shouldn't have. And my mom would bail me out and give me the money to pay them off. And they finally put in boundaries and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. And, and I hated them for it. it. Literally, I had hate for my parents. They mm. cut me off and they said, we're done. We, we love you, but we can't do this anymore. My parents have been married now 50 years. They were going to get a divorce mm. over me because my mom kept enabling me. My dad was so mad about it. Yeah. And um, wow. so they put in boundaries and they said, they said, this is enough. Um, and when they cut me off, like, and they said, we love you, but you're not around, like, until you get sober, you're not allowed around here. Like I'd stolen money, forged checks. And, um, and they were serious about it. One day I stopped by just to get some food. Cause I hadn't eaten in a while. I was running and gunning and, uh, my dad called the cops on me. <laughs> and so they were serious about it. And, and I had a lot of animosity towards them, but that last year of my using, when they finally cut me off of 2000, all of 2012. And so, um, I did all of 2011 in jail. When I got out of jail, um, I was got out and I was so pumped to stay sober because that's the longest I'd ever actually been clean, but there's a much difference of living in recovery, which is living a spiritual life than just staying dry. Like I was just dry mm -hmm. from the drugs in jail. I was getting in fights. I was, mm -hmm. I was, bartering people's pills. I was gambling. I was doing all the shit, all the same behavior. Mm -hmm. So it got out, but I was really, really stoked. I was like, okay, this is my time. I finally had had 10 months clean off of everything and I was ready to go. And, and I uh, got out and about two days after I got out, um, that craving came back and it was so intense and it seemingly out of nowhere. And I remember, I think I'm, I'm going to call him. I'm going to call my dealer. I'm going to call him. He's not going to answer. There's no way he's going to answer. Crackhead just changed the number all the time. He answered. And I went down there. And the whole way down there, I remember I started crying, driving, because for once, everything they taught me, like I played the tape through like they told me to. Mm. And I knew once I start, I don't stop. Mm. And my pattern before was I'd go on two or three month binges and bad binges, like bad. Mm. And something would intervene. My parents put me in detox, rehab. Mm. The cops were always a great intervention, get me clean for a little bit, take me to jail for tw two weeks, three weeks, a month. And um, I knew I was like, okay, you're not going to do it this once. You're going to go and you're not going to stop until something stops you. Don't do this. And it was like, I just kept driving. I was on autopilot. Like, and I, and I did it and, um, and it didn't stop. I didn't draw another sober breath from January 27th, 2012 until November 20th of 2012. And now that was a really long stretch for me. That was 11 months. Cause normally 
it would get really bad and then something would stop. Mm -hmm. But I had terminated my uh, probation and parole. So I didn't have any outstanding charges. My parents were done with me. They were like, until you're sober, we're not talking to you. We love you enough to let you go. And so it just kept going. And that last year, mm -hmm. it got bad. Um, it got really bad. And I was homeless the whole year and I never slept on the streets. I was very resourceful. And I, I say that my entrepreneurship kick, I was always mm -hmm. making moves and shifting and, you mm -hmm. know, and not, not doing legal things, but, um, I, you know, I was middlemaning drug deals and, and, um, but I survived out there somehow for a whole year. And, uh, towards the end of that year, um, and, and by this point, Tara, the fitness was long gone. I was 170 pounds. Like I'm 220 pounds right now. Like, I mean, I think it was 175 pounds when I finally went to jail at the end of that year, jet black hair, which made no sense. Cause I had like blonde eyebrows. I've seen I've a picture you posted. Bangs. You're like unrecognizable. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. It doesn't look like you at all. Yeah. I mean, and you just see the demons and like, I look at my eyes in that picture and I'm like, Phew. Like, because I started doing methamphetamine that last year and, um, and I only share like, drugs, drug, it doesn't matter, but it was the mm -hmm. people I got mixed up with and I wouldn't mm -hmm. sleep for days. And so the psychosis would kick in mm -hmm. and, and it was a very methodical decision. I thought I can't stay awake on heroin because I keep nodding out. So I can't like hustle to get my next high cocaine's too expensive. So I'm going to do some meth each day. Like it was a legit thought process that I thought was going to work out incredibly well for me. Did not. Wow. I ended up crazy. Um, and you know, that last year got really, it got really bad, really dark. I saw some shit that, you know, lots of therapy later was able like horrible stuff happen to people that like, we live in this bubble in Salt Lake and you don't think, oh, that stuff doesn't happen here. Like it does. Mm -hmm. It was gnarly. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's probably, it probably worse other places, but um that last year, at the very end of the year, um, I was my mother called me on November fifteenth or something, or um, and informed me my grandfather had died. And uh, you know, I had plans to see my grandpa twice that year. Of course, I didn't show up. And I remember it was really important for me to go, and she it was really important for her for me to go to the funeral. And she said, "Just do whatever you have to do to be okay." Please, like, and she knew what that meant. Don't be too high that you're drooling on yourself and don't be withdrawing, please. And I was like, okay, you got my word. And of course the day came for the funeral and I ran out of everything that night. And so, but I, I thought I have to go, I have to show up for him. I can battle through this. And when I get back, I'll get some drug, I'll get some heroin, but I was dope sick. They call it. And it's violently ill. It's like the flu times a million plus the worst anxiety you've ever had. And, mm. and I got in a car and, and I, I started, I vomited in her car and I was shaking mm. and shivering. And she said, you can't go like this. And she was crying. She said, what do we have to do? And I said, you gotta go to the dealer's house. So I made my little, little mom who she's not religious anymore. She was at the time, <laughs> um, drive to the drug dealer's house, went in and got it. And, uh, you know, I had to hop in the backseat of her car. Cause by this point we were going to be way late. So she's driving all the way up from Brigham city, which is an hour and a half away from where I live to get to the funeral. And so I hopped in her back seat and uh, proceeded to cook. I, she knew I did heroin. She knew I was a heroin act. She had never watched me do heroin. Mm. So she sees me pull out my spoon and, and put the heroin in there and cooking it up and the needle and trying to find a vein, like the whole ugliness of being a junkie. And I remember she's just looking in a rear view mirror and she's just sobbing and it's just mm. tears. And she's not saying a word, but she is glued at looking at me. And I keep trying not to look and I, and I, and I get the shot in and it, immediately, of course, I feel better. But for once, like it couldn't numb the pain of like the amount of like how big of a selfish asshole I was. Like I made my mother just so I could show up to a funeral, like get dope for me, then watch me do it in her back seat. And she didn't say another word that whole car ride. I mean, she wasn't even wiping the tears off her face. They were just streaming down, just heartbroken. And I remember looking, and in that moment, I looked at her eyes, and, and I thought to myself, you got two options. And I'd never legitimately been suicidal out there, but it was very clear. I said, you have two options. You either need to kill yourself or you need to get sober. There wasn't another option to go on another day like I was living. It was every day was chaos. I was staying in cheap motels and hotels and dope houses and um, 
weird campers. Like it was just bizarre. Mm -hmm. And the killing myself sounded like the better option. But I thought, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I can't, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't go on another day like this. And so that night um, I was arrested in a stolen car that to this day, I don't know. I didn't know was stolen. The guy asked me to drive and it was, it was divine intervention. My, my higher power was looking out the guy, but I choose to call God. I don't even know what it is, but was like, okay. Cause we got pulled over and the guy informed me that the car was stolen. And I remember I was mad at first. And then there was this moment of surrender. I was like, oh, this is it. I'm done. Like, this is like, I was praying. I didn't even know what I was praying to, but I was praying those last couple of days, like make this end. Like something has got to change. Like just make it, it's like something. And um, so I went to jail and um, I was so excited to go to jail. And the cop was like, I've never seen someone so excited to go to jail. And I'm like, I know I'm really excited. <laughs> and um, I didn't know how long I was gonna do in there. I just knew that it was finally my time and I withdrawed and I, and I was so sick and I, you know, said things like I'm gonna kill myself. So they put me up in the crazy unit um, and I laid there on the cement and just, I remember that cold hitting me. And I remember just thinking, this is the last time you have to do this. This is the last time you have to do this if you want to, this is the last time. And I made it through because it feels like you're gonna die, but you're not actually gonna die. And um, I was released 30 days later because the charges were dropped. And I remember I got out of jail and I'm, I'm, I'm skinny. Um, I don't even look like myself. And normally I'd call my drug friends and I called my mother I went left instead of right, so to speak. And it was December 20th. It was colder than shit here in Utah. And she picked me up and she said, you can't come to the house. She said, but I'll drop you off at a recovery meeting. So she did. And that's where my journey began. And some random guy let me stay on his couch because I told him I had nowhere to go. And um, he let me stay there for two weeks until I could get some money to find a room to rent. And it was, I started from the bottom of the barrel, like 505 credit score, nothing to my name, had a had a garbage sack full of clothes, had nothing. And, um, and that's where it began for me. So sorry, that was a really long. Oh story my gosh. Me. No, I, I'm pretty sure me and everyone listening is like hanging on to every word of that. Um, first, thank you for sharing your story. Cause we know that especially opiate addictions are like epidemic levels, <laughs> but where are all these people? Like, where are they? No one's talking about it. No one's talking about this. And I know there's so many people that can relate to that. And I'm, I'm thinking all the way back to like you being this 12 year old kid, you know, moving into high school, my son's 13 right now. And he's like really into like, he wants to go to the gym with me and he wants muscles and he wants girlfriends. And I mean, we just had the conversation yesterday. I'm like, yeah, but you know, that your soul is the most attractive thing about you. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, yeah, but muscles are cool. I'm like, muscles are cool. Muscles are a fun, extra thing you can do. But anyway, it just strikes a chord with me because it's so understandable. Like every little step of that journey was like, I have some pain somebody put something right in front of me. It made me feel better. And then I just kept wanting to feel better. And you didn't have resources. You didn't know where else to turn. Like there was no psychology, like cool personal development, like outlets back then, you know? And so yeah. it's just like, it's so, it's so understandable, like the path that you took. And, um, I, the thing that hit me the most was like, when you were talking about what finally clicked. And you're like, I don't really know. It reminded me of like, um, honestly, like clients who make change changes and me too, like uh, in their bodies. And you kind of hit on that. You're like talking about being ready. And it's truly, it's like, finally, like, like no bullshit, deep, deep, deep. You were like, I want to not do this anymore. Like, no, no, like, but yeah, but there's still this 5%. I do kind of still want to, it was like done. I'm done. I want nothing more than healing. Right. And it's like, man, when that desire level, um, you've probably read thinking grow rich by Napoleon Hill, right? Yeah. A long time ago, but yes. Um, he, long, long <laughs> that book is like my Bible. I love that book so much. It's so enlightened. Um, and it's not, mm. it's not just about money. It's just about, um, manifestation and understanding how the universe works and, um, vibrations and frequencies. And that's what he says. The starting point of all achievement is desire. And I just hear that like your desire level was like 100. You were like, I have to do this and so, want to do this. <laughs> you're so right because, you know, and people could look and go, well, yeah, of course it was that moment with your mother. And yes, that was a turning point, but let me, like the things I was leaving out in those nine years was I had some horrible overdoses that I 
was in a medically induced coma. Like there was other wow. moments that could have struck a chord when you wake up, you've been out for 18 hours because they had to put you in a medically induced coma. You've got charcoal all over your chest, your family sitting there crying. Wow. And like, so there was these other right. moments, but it was like, I was 92 and a half percent, right? Like, right. And it was right. like just that little bit. And instead of me going, okay, because I even think this time, I really think that day when I got out of jail, I was like, I'm probably 51% more ready to get. And so it wasn't a hundred percent, but I knew it was like that glimmer of hope and real quick. It like within a matter of just, a, I, I don't know, a month, it was all the way up to a hundred. Like I, and it was huh. I actually, I changed that. It wasn't the desire. It was the belief in myself. Mm. That's what it was. Mm. I only believed I could say, like, I actually had, you're right. I, right. I digress. A hundred percent desire, but 51% belief that I could right. actually do it. Wow. And then within a month, I was like, I think I think I can do this. It was like 70%. And then within six or nine months, it was like, okay, I have a hundred percent, not only desire, but belief I can do this wow. because my actions started to align with that. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, it, it's just, it was one I had to like be broken down to that point. Um, but again, I don't know what clicked the desire was there. Like it was like a hundred percent desire. And even if I don't think I can do this, I'm going to fake it till I make it. Like, I'm just going to do what they said. And so, you know, it led me back into, uh, into fitness and, yeah. um, I was waiting tables at first. Then I got back into the fitness industry real shortly after. And because that's what I had always done. I got certified as a personal trainer when I was still in high school. So mm. my first job was at Bally Total Fitness. Remember Bally's? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it was like, I mean, even this is 2003 and it still looked like it was stuck in 1981. Yeah. Like it was like arrest and they went out of business shortly after that or sold, I think. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I was the youngest personal trainer that I ever hired. Like that's what I wanted to do. Like I knew I didn't want to like go to four years of college just to get some degree that I didn't care about. Like I didn't like school. I loved fitness and like, yeah. give me an article on a research article on fitness and nutrition and I'll read it. Anything else? I'm like, this sucks. And so I got right back into what I loved to do, which was fitness. And, um, and that really catapulted me. And I remember when I, when I, it was probably like six months sober and I got off a call with a client and she cried to me and she told me how grateful she was for me. And she said, it's just my relationship with food. My relationship with my husband is better. Our intimacy, like everything. And she said, you've helped me way beyond just losing this weight. And I remember I got off that call and I was like happy tears. And I had this overwhelming feeling come over me. I was so happy. I remember getting in my piece of shit car that was $500. It was a one door. It was really a two door, but the, the pasture side didn't open. So when I was hanging out with girls, I was like, so that you just have to climb through. It was really embarrassing. I'm like, just climb on through. There you go. You want a radio? I don't got one, but I got my phone. We can play. But I, I turned on like a Demi Lovato. So I don't even remember. It was the cheesiest song. And I'm, I'm, I'm singing at the top of my lungs. And I remember it finally hit me. And I was like, holy shit, I'm 28 years old. And this is the first time I've ever truly felt grateful. Like mm. everything I was looking for in a bottle, a pill, a needle mm. was right there, like within me. It was like I was searching for this feeling. Mm -hmm. And it was almost embarrassing that I actually had never, I don't think, felt grateful. If that's what feeling truly gratitude, mm. like just unbelievably grateful was, I had never felt it to that point. And it was this catapult where I'm like, that's the shit I want. And like on the flip side, I'm like, how am I getting paid to do this too? This is crazy. And so- um, I just ran with it and it's been, you know, eight and a half years later. And, and, you know, I, I so grateful for the, for the tools recovery taught me and, and, uh, and continue to teach me, you know, you talked about like vibrations and, and energy and, and we've even had some chats at the gym and, um, it, my, my first four years of recovery were very dogmatic in the AA community. And that's, mm -hmm. I don't judge that, but it was like, oh, this is sober. That is not. And right. Probably over the last two or three, I've become much more open-minded to a lot of different things to evolve. And, um, and I still use the principles of the 12 steps, but just not the dogma of necessarily AA. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the principle of the 12 steps is just basically trust God, clean house and help others. Like, and the cleaning house part for me, I got a lot more open-minded what that looks like. And so I, I don't need to go on a rabbit hole there, but uh, you well, know, I, what? I, 
just my view of what sober necessarily is today has changed. And like mm. my just, I am just all the shit I used to think was woo woo is all the shit I'm doing today in my life is better than it's ever been, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that lack of spiritual connection. I mean, I've seen it destroy people. I've seen, you know, we've talked about me leaving Mormonism. It's something I talk about a lot. Cause it was a big part of my journey. And I've seen people like abandon spirituality altogether when they leave Mormonism, I did the same thing. And it's like this deep sense of emptiness. And it doesn't mean like your spirituality, like you said, you were like, I didn't even know who I was praying to. I still feel like that. I don't really know. I, I know something is out there. Something's helping me. Something's guiding me. There's just like way too many inexplicable things happening. I don't know how it works. I just know it works. <laughs> and, um, I, I, I think when you said, um, that that lady was saying how much you helped her, I was like, this is so beautiful because you're like, imagine let's go way back to that party where you were given the painkiller. Like imagine none of that ever happened. N none of this journey ever happened. And you just like kind of straight arrowed it straight into being a personal trainer and going all through your twenties and just being this personal trainer. Do you even think that you would have even an ounce of the depth and the empathy and the insights on what it actually takes to change if you hadn't gone through any of that? Yeah, no, I don't I mean, think so. Like, I'm, you know, <laughs> It, it finally clicked. I, I, I said these things because that's what people said in the recovery meetings was like, I'm Brad and I'm a grateful addict or an alcoholic or, and I was like, I don't know if I, I feel grateful, but I'm not really grateful that I went through this. And it was like the last probably three years, it just became so evident that I'm like, wow, it's so beautiful that I literally like, you know, I used to think I wasted a decade of my life because when you, you know, I didn't start really making any, any money, like an actual, like W2 till I was like 30 years old. Like, like I felt so behind. I started mm -hmm. a business at 32 mm -hmm. and I'm like, I had friends that started a business at 22. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. I felt so far behind, but mm -hmm. I've just really leaned in. I'm so grateful. I went through all of that. Like just the way I view the world now that, and then that's why I resonate connect with you because you're very observant to life. And so many people walk like this, just so narrow. I'm like, gosh, you guys are missing it. Like you don't just work to pay bills and, and do this and then die. Like there are yeah. so many beautiful things yeah. that are out here and that people just miss, you know? I think a lot of us that was more, you know, I similar and for different reasons, you know, I didn't start my business until I was 33 because I was a stay at home mom all those years. And I felt that same sense of like urgency of like, I'm way behind. Everyone else is like a decade. Everyone that I went to high school with is like a decade ahead of me and more like, ugh, like this feeling of ripped. I was like, no, <laughs> you gained a lot of insights and a lot of depth during that time period that you're bringing into it now. And somebody told me once they're like, they were hearing my story and they were like, oh, it's like, it's like your whole life just makes sense. It was like, it was all just preparing you for where you're at right now. And I was like, yeah, but only because I'm using it. Like I could be like a dental assistant somewhere. And I don't know. I mean, maybe I would talk to a couple friends here and there about all the shit I went through and what I've learned, but you and I were choosing to use it to help other people. And so it like, it's, it kind of, um, of course we're going to feel grateful for it. I'm so, cause if I was just some like shallow, like, sorry, like daddy's little girl that just had everything easy and handed me my whole life. Like how the hell would I help people who are going through pain if I'd never been through a lot of pain myself? So I think it's, it's amazing that you've been able to like one that you've been able to do what you've done. Cause your story's freaking awesome Two that you've been able to funnel it into something that can now help other people. And three, the last thing is like, I did want to hit on this a little bit. I do, you know, I do DNA testing with my clients. I think I, maybe I mentioned that to you. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. But one thing I've noticed is that almost all of my high achievers have genetic issues with dopamine production. Like they, they mm. underproduce dopamine or they have dopamine receptor issues. And so do I, and it's like every single high achiever <laughs> that I do this with. And I thought, and so what does that cause you to have? It causes you to have what we call an addictive personality, because when dopamine's low, you'll do anything to get it higher and feel better. And just, you know, that's unrelated to like, obviously there's like personal pain and we don't want to be alone with our own feelings. And it's unrelated to some other issues, but like it will cause you to have a little bit more of an addictive personality. So I always say like, you can either, and, and what's funny is a lot of those people will say, that's interesting because like my dad and all my brothers are drug addicts, you know? And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, so you can either take that and you can funnel into something that destroys your life, or you can funnel into something that builds your life. And like, you kind of just figure that out naturally. You're like, Oh, I'll just funnel this into fitness. I'll just funnel this into being like a badass entrepreneur. I'll just funnel this, like this, um, uh, kind of desire to like 
do things a lot, a lot of repetitions, get really good at it, go all the way, be in extremes. Like you kind of can funnel that into things that bring power into your life and like turn your weakness into a superpower, you know? So oh, I, I, I don't think there's anything you know, wrong like, with that. <laughs> it's not like, and honestly, I think the evolution over the last eight and a half years for me has been, you know, understanding that I am that person and that I've done the thing where the grind and grind and grind, like, yeah. and I'll, I'll, you know, I want this uh, invisible trophy for someone who grinds the hardest. Don't you know, mm. I grind 70 hours a week. Look yeah, at me yeah, and yeah. I'm like, are you happy? And I'm like, no, but I'm going to be happy one day. <laughs> like part of it was understanding that I am wired that way. Even for example, like, um, I'm only training four days a week right now. Now, normally I'm like five, but I used to be a six to seven guy, no matter what, because even though I understood from a physiological factor that wasn't the best for me, I almost relied on that workout to give me that hit of dopamine and endorphins. So then I would be happy after. Well, I just need to get my workout in, then I'll be in a good mood. And so part of this kind of experiment with me is like really learning to be like, embrace the endorphins I get from working out and the release but like trying to channel that same stuff and be happy mm. on the days that I'm not working out. And this is why I've got really into breath work and meditation because for me to get caught, like that's hard. I can mm -hmm. go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the evolution. I talk about that a lot with my clients too, is like, listen, if you want a coach who's just gonna give you some macros and a training plan, you can probably find one cheaper than me that will do that for you. But like, if you wanna, if you wanna truly dive in because I picture this fitness as a four-legged chair mm -hmm. or a bar stool, you know, and it's got your emotional health, your mental health, your emotional, or your physical health and your spiritual health. And I'm telling you, like, lean too far on one of those bar stool legs, like, and the other start, get, you know, getting wobbly, it's gonna cave. Like, they all yep. affect each other. And that's why, you know, even you going through a bodybuilding show prep right now, my first one I did was, uh, honest to God, a very spiritual experience. I had, I, you know, I was jacked as a 17 year old. So everyone had told me, man, you should compete. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. One day, one day. And it was, I was actually trying to get ready a couple of times, but then just couldn't stay sober. And it was always something I talked about, um, mm -hmm. that I was going to do one day, one day, one day, I was full of one days, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I said, okay, I'm going to, I want to compete, but I want to get a year of sobriety first. Then if I get a year, then I'll, I'll I want to do one. So I, and I got a year and then at 18 months, I did my first show and it was a, it was an incredible experience. I loved mm -hmm. the, the grind, the journey, the, like that I could prove to myself, I could do extra hard shit. And I wasn't going in with any expectations. There was no ego involved. It was, I was still very, very in tune spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And a funny thing happened is I went on that stage and I did well and mm -hmm. I won my class mm -hmm. and I was like, almost won the overall. Mm. And everyone was like, dude, you got a real, you got a real spot in the sport and the ego kicked in mm. and it was like, damn right. I do. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to do another one. And so six, nine months later, I think we did another one. And that experience was awful. Mm. And that's why I want to compete one more time because I look mm. back and I have to remember that first experience was so fun. It was so fun. It was so challenging, so hard. But I, and that's what I kind of hear from you. Like it was a fun challenge and it was gritty and it was like a new level of respect for people who do this. The second one was a lot of ego. I wanted to go be nationally qualified. Mm. Like the ego kicked in. I let go of all my spiritual practices. Mm. Somehow I stayed sober. I don't know how I mm. destroyed a relationship. I was in it. Like, mm. I mean, I came home, I was two weeks out from my show and her shit was gone. And like, mm. I look back and I don't blame her. I was, I was a narcissist. I, I, I don't believe I'm a narcissist, but I was definitely acting like one. I was mm. so self-absorbed self. I mean, cause a show gives you a reason to do that. It's not like you're working yeah. with a team. And right. so it was all about me. And yeah. I was like, I'll get back to the spiritual and all that stuff later. Like I've got to win. And I went on and I didn't win. And, mm. and I remember that's when I was like, I'm not doing it. Like I, I finally had a hard look in the mirror and I was like, dude, you are about, you're about one more week away from picking up some drugs. Like, yeah. mm, <laughs> like yeah. you are not right. And so, you know, it, it's very interesting. I think how you go about those kind of things. And so that's why I'm interested in doing one, one more time, because I got to think back, like the first one was, and this time, if it was ever disrupting these other areas of my life that are not only just crucial for my happiness, but I, like, I believe, you know, I've seen people with 10 years of sobriety 
start using opiates again. And like real quick, they lose everything. And I'm like, what happens? And I'm like, they just stop doing the simple shit. But no longer do I do those daily things, gratitude drawing, breath work, connecting spiritually, doing these mm -hmm. things because out of fear that I won't stay sober, it's because I show up better as a human being. I right. produce better content. Yeah. I tell the truth. More. I'm, not, yep. I'm not nearly agitated by others' opinions because um, that was super hard. When I first started posting content, I actually hired a content mentor. Um, his name is Jordan Syatt. And, mm -hmm. and Jordan was like looking at my content. He was like, dude, this is awful. Stop <laughs> posting this. Like, this is of no value. It's narcissistic. This is, the, and he, he did it in a way that he was laughing. And so I laughed with him, but I was like, he's like, this isn't you. You're trying to be like every IG and like, no wonder you can't grow a following. Mm -hmm. And so he said, just start telling the truth. What would that look like? And I'm like, well, mm. I don't want to offend people. And he goes, give me a break, dude. He's like, mm. then you're never going to build content. And so again, I, I started telling the truth. And at first these people, when I would say things and they were my truth, that doesn't mean it's the truth mm -hmm. necessarily, but I would, the keyboard warriors would come out and I would be like, why are they being so mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a personal development journey being a social media influencer. You, you got to learn, you got to learn how to let things go and not take things personally and stand in your truth. <laughs> yeah. I just had somebody the other day tell me, um, okay, you, you big, you, you stupid tatted meathead. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't bother me because today yeah. I know who I am. I know what I stand yep. for. And I know that it's okay for people to you know, and while I would, I, I would, I love when people will disagree with me, but in a way that creates an open dialogue on comments. So people, other people can see it. I really appreciate it. And I always tell them like, thank mm -hmm. you for respectfully disagreeing with me. So yeah. I can state my point of view when right. you attack me and tell me I'm an uneducated idiot, not knowing me, you know, it, then we're not going to go back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm, I'm just going to dismiss you. Exactly. Nor do I let it affect me because I just am getting to this place where I just don't care yeah. what people who I don't know think about me. Well, and you it's know? just such like, a reflection of where they're at or they wouldn't post something like that. Like I'm sure plenty of people disagree with what I say sometimes, but they don't need to, they don't need to comment meanly and let me know. They're just like, no Tara. And they just keep scrolling. You know what I mean? Cause those are self-confident people. The really insecure people who need to be whole, he heard are the ones that are like, no, you're wrong. You know? And man, you know, as you were talking about all that, I thought about so much of, um, in a, in a fitness journey, I think a typical fitness journey, there's so much proving at first, right? It's like, you got to prove that you can do it, prove that you're like attractive enough, prove, 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 prove. And then you get to a point where you're good. You know, like I, um, this has been a very interesting experiment for me doing this competition because I truly was completely happy with my body before I started. Right. So that makes it a little difficult to want to like drive into these levels of discomfort there's no pain when factor, right? yeah, there's, there's no, no and I'm not like trying to be some like Miss Olympia or something. Like I really just wanted the professional experience of it for kind of like professional development. So when there's not this, like, I'm not good enough yet, but just watch me. Like when you don't have that, it makes it really, really hard. Like we get off this, I'm going to go have three ounces of white fish and one rice cake. Okay. Like it makes it very difficult to want to do stuff like that. But I think it's a, it's a growth journey, you know? And like, I also started in a place of not enoughness. I was having marriage problems and I was like, if I just get hot enough, then I'll be lovable enough. You know, like I went through that same stuff too. And, um, and you learn and you grow and you evolve and healing comes in your path and you get a spiritual practice. And soon you're anchored in your own freaking self-love enough that it's like all of these things just become options. It's just like, I know I can do that because I know I am a powerful soul. I know I can do that. And you start to live in abundance. Gratitude really brings that where it's like, I know I'm capable of all these things, but why, you know, why am I doing right. it? What is driving my behavior? So, um, yeah, I, I honestly, I got to commend you too. they just, the way, you know, what, how I ever got first introduced to you, not personally but on social was, um, a past relationship you were in. And, and I had had uh, an acquaintanceship with that guy. And I just look at the how you talk today compared to what was that four years ago, five years ago? Yeah. Yep. It, you're a whole different person. Thank and you. You survived that. And we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. But like <laughs> I it, and the more I've evolved, people like that. And, and, the, and that's not just thinking of like there is so like where I'm almost repulsed by these energies now because mm -hmm. I can't like. 
I just see so much. I cannot deal with narcissism. I've just had to cut some friends out and I didn't have to have a conversation with them. I just stopped really like messing with them because the level of narcissism is almost suffocating to my energy and like pulls me down. And it's, it's, um, it's, repulsive like once it, repulsive, i know what you mean it, yeah it's it's because like you have your own self-respect and self-love and like kindness and gentleness in your soul when some something comes at you with this very like uh dominating yucky self-serving energy it's just you just don't want to be around it but thank you i talk a lot on my other podcast kick-ass life i talk about that relationship a lot so if anybody listens to that like oh okay oh, yeah i didn't <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't talk but about honestly, it in depth, but I just I say evolve, that I was, I'm like, unfollow you. I cannot <laughs> deal with this. Like, no. And, and, you know, and honestly, legit. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that's another thing. I see so many people, you know, my clients where they're getting caught up in these comparison games and, and, uh, and I'm like, you know, who are you following? Like unfollow yeah. like that you know, influencer has 4 million followers that only posts pictures from her prime. And like, you know, unfollow these people, follow the people you want to like that bring joy into your life. Yeah. That's why I never, if somebody unfollows me, I'm like, cool. Like, you and, know, and the other thing is like, I'm just, I'm being brutally honest right now, but don't be a victim about your own emotions. Like if you are following mm. some chick and the way her body looks makes you feel bad, guess whose fault that is yours. That is on you. That is not on her. I see that chick and I might see, hmm, wow. I wonder what happened that caused her to feel that she needs to post that every day. Like my heart kind of hurts for her. Like, I love you. You're beautiful. It's okay. Versus somebody who maybe is in a low self-esteem spot is like, Ugh, never going to look like that. I don't want to be that. I don't want that. I don't, I'm like, oh girl, come here. Like I could make pictures like that too. I don't want to, cause I don't need that. Cause I love myself. Sorry. Maybe I'm being judgmental, but that's my perception. That's and my, I think that's, and, true. <laughs> and my, my perception is it's mine, but it's my responsibility. And just like, you know, that relationship, like I was in mega victim mode after that relationship until I finally did my own healing work and recognize like the results I'm getting in my life right now are a direct reflection of what's going on inside me. So mm. if I'm in really unhealthy relationships and I'm being mm. quote unquote taken advantage of, no one was holding a gun to my head. I agreed to those things. So I had to just take a cold, hard look at like, where I'm at right now, mentally and emotionally is getting me the results that I'm getting in my life. How I feel in the presence of other people is up to me, how I show up, what I say yes to what I say no to that's all on me. And so I think, you know, in, in regards to, ah, just personal growth, I guess on that end, like in your, what you're partaking of online or in your relationships, it's like, it's, it's all on you. Like you create your own reality. And just like you're saying, like, if you don't like, there's certain people, I don't want to follow them. I don't find their energy. Like it doesn't agree with me. I don't like, no, thank you. You know, but I do follow people that I'm like, dude, yes, mm, that is good stuff. Or I follow people who challenge me. I do. There are some people mm-hmm. in the inter- in- industry I follow. Cause I'm, I want to be challenged. I don't want to be dogmatic in some little cult of uh, just all the people who agree with me. I kind of want to see what other people think too. So yeah. Well, uh, and that's what I, I said it on the podcast a year and a half ago. And it stands true even probably more now, even, even probably more now because what you're, I've always, I've always, and I am not an expert on keto. I'm, I'm well-versed enough that like there's yeah. clients where I've had to go through some of those protocols for whatever reasons. Yeah. Um, and it's not my main form, but I think the evolution of a coach is I used to be just this like hardcore, first off, it was like hardcore, like meal plans at these certain macro. And then it was yeah. like, okay, meal plans are, we got to teach people macros, but then it was like, well, I only do like balanced macro. And then it's evolved more where I get really irritated when, you know, there's certain people where I, you know, and, and friends is a loose term, but I'm friends with where I'm like, <laughs> dude, quit hating on keto. Can you find something else to hate on? Because you just, you're saying that they're dogmatic dicks, but what are you doing? Right. You're being a dogmatic dick. Like your <laughs> way is the right way. Like, what do you know? Like, and it's, you know, it'll yeah. remain nameless, but it's a guy that I like know. And I'm like, dude, stop. Like you're being a hypocrite. And I think it's just, it's so important to like, you got to figure out what works for you and have a coach that's open-minded enough to be like, you know, yeah. I mean, the- yeah. Like even you eating your, you went, I mean, you, you were like, damn, like I'm eating carbs and guess what? Like you probably learned a lot, but you still probably maybe feel the best on a keto plan. 
Oh, I don't. No, no, no. Uh, let's be very clear nope. about that. No, <laughs> I'm totally open you about that. Do you do a hybrid? I no, I think keto, I did keto for a time. I think keto was a great, uh, like metabolic reset is how I look at it to make sure that you can run off fats for fuel. But I did that for a year. I just, every once in a while will fast or drift back into ketosis just to make sure I can without any sort of so hiccup in like my metabolism. But yeah, yeah. I, like you, I, I'm a huge, pretty- uh-huh. Yeah, and, and that's huge. That. And most people don't even understand what that means, right? It's to be to be able to flip back and forth, right? And that's incredibly important. That's why I went through my own little keto journey, probably yeah, what is it six months ago, was okay. just to prove to myself I could and see how I felt, and also so I can be a better coach. Yeah, like, exactly. So I can actually help people. Like, hey, here's some food ideas. If I'm like, well, I don't do that. I eat carbs. Right. And I can tell you right now, like there's some people that it's basically like this, that more obese you are and more insulin resistant you are probably the more keto is going to work for you. The more lean and muscular and athletic you are probably the less likely keto is going to be a great approach for you. Right. So it's kind of like a sliding scale that way. And then there's other reasons, but I like, in my opinion, like where I guess I'm going on tangent a little bit, but like, why would we have carbs (laughs) available on the planet if you weren't supposed to eat them? And then on the flip side, like train your body what to do in the absence of incoming carbs. You want to turn into some freaking maniac all the time because you're so hangry because you don't have incoming fuel. Like, you don't have to live That's like that exactly either. exactly what I got to. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a health <laughs> professional and I'm, I'm that guy. And so it was a really good experiment for me. Yeah. And, um, and I know I can do it now. And I'll fluctuate right. now between how many carbs I'm eating. Yep. Gives you more freedom. Just to make sure I can go back, you mm-hmm. know, and improve insulin sensitivity and find these markers and um, again, it's all that biohacking stuff that I love that you talk about yeah. because it's the next level stuff. And it's funny because my content is like so driven to the basics that I'm like, sometimes I'm like, and that's kind of where I've tried to make my niche. But yeah. there's times where I'm like, no, no, I want to share actually some important shit with you. So I'm going <laughs> to, because maybe, maybe this doesn't get as many likes, maybe it's not as many shares because it doesn't apply to as many people, but I, I still want to talk about the stuff like biohacking stuff fascinates me yeah because i know you do sorry to cut you off i know you do cold immersion like almost every day right like you're you're big on that i love cold therapy too um didn't you start something though where you're doing something called like the next level or something like that i thought i saw that on your story yeah the next level yeah so it's an eight week like intense intimate um course where i mean we only take a sermon and we really dive in we you know i i partnered with uh two of my friends one of them does uh um, he's breathwork certified and he works as yeah. far as the heart map, uh, heart map Institute, which is Very kind cool. of like heart brain coherence. Yeah. And then his wife does, um, she's does energy work through the, uh, the, um, what is it called? The emotion code. It's just emotion code practitioner. And so she works on clearing some of those energetic, like, you know, those our yeah. heart walls and these things. And so, and then, you know, we do physically, there's a, there's a, you know, component of physical and health, obviously through the whole thing, but yeah, it was more of a deeper dive of like what I do in my coaching, but like a really intense, like uh, there's a spiritual week, there's a relational week, there's an emotional week, there's a mental that's week, awesome. there's a physical week. And, and so, yeah, that's been, that's been a blast. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun to watch people really kind of like, you know, shift and, and, uh, and change. So, because that yeah. really like you can lose all the weight you want, but if you're not changing who you are, yeah, like I promise you, you're going to gain it back. Like I watch yep. people, I watch people diet down for shows and then they're just almost unrecognizable six months later. And yes, I understand that <laughs> there was probably some severe adaptations and they probably didn't reverse diet correctly, but they didn't really actually change who they were. And so they mm. went right back to the same day and it crushes me for them because I know then they want to do another show because that's the I only know. way they think they can get down. I know. I know. I've seen it even recently. And I, I feel bad. I, I shouldn't joke, but I was joking about that with my kids. I was like this time Sunday night Oreos. I was like, I'm going to get so big. People are going to be like, Oh, Tara, I didn't recognize you. Are you still, oh. are you still a health coach? Still doing it? <laughs> Good to see ya. Um, right. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I just want to be full. <laughs> That's all I even want Oreos. I just want to be full. But um, yeah, I, I, I love that um, because I mean, that's me too. Like I won't coach people anymore unless they'll do personal development with me because I'm like, I don't feel good about it. I do have my little keto in and out thing I do with groups, but I'm like, 
I'm just letting you guys know, this is just, you're just scratching the surface, but if this is all you want, we can scratch the surface. But if you really want to change your life, like it's not, it's not the, it's not the meal plan. It's, it's your mind. It's your soul. It's that stuff. It's your own self-worth, your own value. And you don't have to earn that. But once you know, once you know that it's innately there, you will perform higher. That's the biggest thing that drives me crazy is that I, I feel like people don't really, they think if they give themselves credit and see themselves and accept that they're enough as they are, they're like terrified to do that because that means, cause they've been using like self self mutilation, self like abuse for so long as a motivator, as a driver that they're afraid if they, if they tell themselves they're enough as is that they'll lose all drive and then they'll become 400 pounds and just sit around and eat Twinkies all day. And it's like, no, if you give yourself that you're enough, you'll behave like someone who's powerful that can do anything. It's the opposite. So I love that you're doing that too. And that sounds super cool. Are you, um, is that something you're gonna be doing regularly or just this one time? Yeah, no, this is the second group of it. And so, um, you know, I think we'll uh, we'll keep doing it. I mean, launches for more of like a high ticket item are stressful, I'm going to be honest. So like okay. we were, I mean, it's an eight week program. Then there's like a, a much lower like barrier and like touch, you know, mentorship afterwards that most of the people did. But um, cool. I think we'll probably do it uh, four times a year. So okay. like, you know, okay. give a break a month. And then so we'll launch again, probably uh, the end of April or this group is coming to the end, the end of this month. So probably launch in may but yeah i'm gonna okay. keep doing it and honestly it's because i people are i see this change like i see people showing up differently even just on the zoom call their shoulders they're sitting a little higher mm. they're smiling they just shine a little brighter and i'm like that's awesome it gives me hope that like they can continue yeah. this like and keep going you know it's like um i mean i just you know i just think anytime we can have this spiritual awakening and understand that like you know that we have to like get this divine, just like connected right here. You just see things differently. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, it's all the principles I learned in recovery and then, and then continue to learn that, you know, like today I used to be, I used to say, Oh, I'm an anxious person. I don't, I don't really have anxiety and I'm definitely not an anxious person. Like I used to categorize myself as these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, like when you accept you're enough, like that's yeah. a scary thought. You're like, huh? So what, then I'm just going to do nothing. Right. Like, no, like he actually drives you more. It's yeah. You're going to create me of like, <laughs> wow. Like I have all the power within me, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm going through some life shit right now. Like I'm going through a divorce and, and like, I'm yeah. happy to report that it is probably one of the better divorces you're going to see because I decided how I want to show up in this and I want to show up with dignity yeah. and, and I want to keep the greed and, and the ego just yeah. out of it. And I've, and you know, like we're getting along probably better as friends now than we used to. And I'm sure there'll be bumps in the road, but that's because like I, all the principle I've learned, I just want to give that to people. I'm like, yeah, I don't know how, yeah. like even three years ago, if I would have gone through, it would have been a nightmare. I would have been the worst person to deal with mm. ego, vengeful greed, you name it all the, you know, mm. but it came out and they're just not today. And so, and all that applies to people's fitness journey because all of these things are the things that continually ruin my clients results because they yeah. not, they don't feel like they're enough. And then their husband says something and then they get in a fight and then, you know, and then they emotionally eat and it's just the same story. Over and, and it's over. all them. It's all rooted inside. It's a, it's a self-love issue truly. And when it comes down to the end, end of the road, it's like, because the reason you're able to like, have a healthier divorce is because you have self love, right? And when you when that when you're full of that, then you can give it. You cannot give love until you have self love. You are only mm. manipulating love out of other people to get it for yourself until you have self love. It's all fake bullshit. I'm I just oh, I've seen so it over true. and over. You're uh, just you're you think you're being loving, but you're just doing things do, to get validation and love instead. So it's actually manipulation. It's not love because what happens oh, once God, they don't give it true. back to you, then you're pissed at them. So did you love them or were you just using them? <laughs> so yeah, once that, once that loves in place, man, it just changes everything. It changes how you show up. It changes your relationships. It changes what you like mm, feel, feel worthy of in terms of food and your career and all of it. So I'm just like, I'm hearing through your spiritual practices, that's just been increased. So you don't have to go looking for it everywhere. It's like, yeah totally life-changing why has always um, resonated with you that's why i got all the love and respect for you in the world and the fact likewise. that you showed up today a day <laughs> before your show i'm serious and you didn't just show up you showed up like you weren't <laughs> just here no and that's admirable 
you know, and that's somebody who's done the work because people will use these things as an excuse. I look at my last Mm -hmm. show. I didn't do shit for two days before except for (laughs) make everyone check in on me. Is Brad okay? (laughs) Are you tired? Are you doing okay? Did you eat rice cake? Like it was like, I'm like, dude, like I wouldn't do anything. Like all my clients are just like, no, this is about me. So props to you. That's someone who's done the work that shows up in an energetic space, even when they're tired, even when they're exhausted and they have a show the next day. So props. Thank you. you. Thanks, Brad. And um, to find out about all your stuff, I know you have a team of coaches. Brad has so many amazing things. Make sure you're following him at the Sober Bodybuilder on Instagram. I'll link everything in the show notes. And then your website is at keynutrition.com. Yep. Yep. Just so, keynutrition.com. So and then the K-E-Y. next level experience is uh, uh, mynextlevelexperience.com. So mynextlevelexperience.com. Okay. We'll link that. And then also um, the Key Nutrition podcast. It's it, it's getting big. Yeah, Brad. Like you guys are. Yeah. You got this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's. it's uh, 250, 240, I think we're on episodes. So yeah. Wow. Um, It's done. It's, you know, it's, it's a slow grind, just like everything. And it just like built up, but it was just consistency every week. Never missed a Tuesday and Friday launch. Not once. Wow. Uh, Wow. Good job. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we trend really well in the, in the nutrition charts. It's, it's, it's doing every time I check it, I'm like, that's so crazy because I just have fun doing this. So yeah. Oh, you're you're made for it. Brad's like such an amazing interviewer and it's funny and fun and light. So make sure you guys check that out. I'll link that as well. Um, Brad, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for being an example, for like being, keeping it real, for having like a good heart coming in the right place, helping people batting away all the bullshit that we see in this industry. That's nonsense to bring people back into a place of clarity. And also for Sheena, thank you for Sheena. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, just scroll through his Instagram and just like creating a space. Like you really have created a space where people can feel like seen and safe in this like crazy social media world of, of health and fitness. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I received that.